welcome to the Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains, where we explore the history and the mysteries surrounding the Superstition Mountains. The first lost mine of the Superstition Mountains, which was not the Lost Dutchman Mine, it was the Dr. Thorne Mine. Our story really begins uh, just prior to the Civil War when C.E. Cooley moved from Virginia to Santa Fe, New Mexico. When the Civil War broke out, he joined the Union Army. And sometime during the Civil War or shortly thereafter, he met this Dr. Thorne. Um, Dr. Thorne convinced him about this mine that he, he had been taken to by the Apache Indians. And just as a short review, in the late 1850s, Dr. Thorne was captured by some Apache Indians. And these people realized this was an unusual individual and a very valuable person. And he treated the Indians while he was in, under captivity. Eventually, he, he got away from them and ended up at Fort McDowell, which was established in 1865. That although he wasn't an army doctor, he did continue to treat the Apaches that lived in and around Fort McDowell. And uh, a couple of, you know, the things that we consider normal everyday occurrences with a doctor were somewhat mysterious to the Apaches. And uh, they were so happy with Dr. Thorne and his treatment of the Indians that they wanted to reward him. So they took him blindfolded from Fort McDowell into the superstitions to a, a mine where he was allowed to take all the ore he could carry. And then, of course, they took him blindfolded back to Fort McDowell. Uh, you would think uh, from hearing the story that this was just a one-day trip. Wouldn't be that far. Uh, getting documentation on stuff like this is rather difficult. I mean, we can't sit here and say Dr. Thorne's mine ever existed or the Lost Dutchman mine ever existed. But you can't disprove a theory just because you didn't find it, you know. But there is documentation about the search for Dr. Thorne's lost mine. C.E. Cooley, uh, after talking to uh, Dr. Thorne, who gave him all the clues of the things that he saw while he, when they took the blindfold off, uh, the ability to see the Sombrero Butte in the distance, a stone corral, and a few other things he described, and perhaps even showed him uh, a piece of the gold that he had, the ore that he had left over. Uh, C.E. Cooley took it to heart and organized a, a search for the mine in 1869. Um, Cooley was an unusual individual. When he came to Arizona, he acquired with a partner uh, a considerable amount of land. And um, when the time came to divide that land up to see who got the best piece, uh, was, they decided to do it over a card game. And it was Cooley that drew the low card and won the best piece of land. And that's how Sholo got its name, because he showed the low card. Uh, Banta was also in the group, uh, AF Banta. All these men were former military. Uh, they were all scouts for the army. And while Banta was scouting one group of military, he was the man that discovered the meteorite crater. And the leader of the army squad that he was scouting for nicknamed it Franklin's Hole. AF -A Banta Franklin was he usually went by Franklin even though that was his middle name and of course today they just call it the meteorite crater and uh, Henry W. Wood Dodd was the third man he was a colonel but I couldn't find much information about him or even find his picture but these three men left the Zuni village in New Mexico and they had uh, several Cayotoro Indian scouts and guides. And they made their way from uh, the Zuni villages all the way down to approximately where Sibiqui is today, uh, part of the Indian reservation. Uh, there they met friendly Indians, Cayotoro Indians, uh, because uh, Cooley was married to a chief's daughter, Chief Pedro, P-E-D-R-O. I'm not sure that's the way you pronounce it, but uh, uh, in the bargain, um, I guess according to Indian tradition, the younger city, sister of the wife went along with the package. <laughs> so he had both of them on his hands. Whether he married them or not is, uh, I don't know, but um, 
he was well known among the, among the Indians. Cooley, in fact, uh, was the man who um, uh, suggested um, the White Mountains as an Indian reservation at, F at Fort Apache. And um, so they recuperated two or three days. You know, today we get in a car and we, uh, we can go anywhere in Arizona in three and a half hours. But these guys, you know, that they had to follow the military rule uh, 30 miles a day on beans and hay. So they spent a lot of nights in the field getting to uh, Sibiqiu. As they uh, prepared to go further west in a search for Dr. Thorne's mine, they were met by some Pinnell Indians who warned them that if they crossed their boundary, there would be trouble. And uh, although the Carretero guides were willing to go on, uh, the three white men decided that it wasn't worth starting a war over with these friendly Indians behind them, so they called off the search. So 1869 was the first search for Dr. Thorne's mine, which ended in absolutely nothing. But Banta became a, a, a newspaper man, and he took copious notes of everything that he did. And this is some documentation that you will find in the Journal of Arizona History put out by the Arizona Historical Society from Tucson, some of these old journals that have been around. And uh, Banta also published uh, some of his treks like this in uh, the Prescott paper and uh, later on in the Payson paper. Um, I don't think that any of those things survived, but it stirred up the imagination of a lot of people. In fact, uh, an, another trek uh, to look for Thorne's mine occurred it's still in 1869 when uh, a Thomas Miller, a uh, miner, Thomas Miner was his name, um, uh, organized uh, 28 men from Prescott who came down to Verde River and they were all to meet at the Salt River just, just below Fort McDowell. Uh, no, no numbers were mentioned, but um, Wickenburg sent a party and Phoenix sent a party, met with the Prescott party and uh, Cooley's Sholo party. So if you just averaged out 30 men per group, you'd have over 100 men in this, this first group. But another group was organized in Tucson. And uh, Governor Safford, the territorial governor, was the leader of that group. And also involved in that was um, some prominent names, but Al Sieber, of all people, was one of the people in Governor Safford's group. There was a, there was a, a roster of people that listed as 267 people involved in this whole thing, and they met in Florence. Uh, Superior didn't exist at that time. Mesa didn't exist at that time. Goldfield hadn't been discovered yet, uh, but uh, they, they they all grouped together in, in uh, Florence and uh, went over to Globe and then up into um, the uh, Tonto Basin where Roosevelt Lake is now established, further north into the uh, Sierra Anca Mountains, which would be near where Payson is today. Uh, one man was killed by accident, which did nobody explain. Another man was killed by Indians. They lost a few horses and the Tucson group after a uh, couple of weeks in the field, decided to call it off and went back to Tucson. Um, the Banta, the um, Cooley group decided then to go on back to the Sholo, but the, uh, super, the Phoenix, Wickenburg, and Prescott group went down the Salt River through the Superstition Mountains, exploring all the way for the Dr. Thorne's Lost Mine. When they got back to um, Fort McDowell, uh, they disbanded. The Prescott group went back up the floor, uh, Verde River. Uh, Wickenburg followed the Phoenix group to Phoenix and then went on back to Wickenburg. Except for one man. One man decided to do it on his own and that man was none other than Jacob Waltz. Now, since we don't have a roster that existed, how do we know that Jacob Waltz was among this group? Well, there was a contemporary author by the name of Milton Rose who wrote a book, and he made several verbal claims that he had a relative that was in the Phoenix group and that he knew that 
Jacob Waltz is in that group. And evidently, Jacob Waltz uh, uh, continued his search. He re-outfitted and continued his search. And, uh, and indeed, we know that he did find gold and it was under his bed when he died. I was enamored with Al Sieber. I couldn't believe the history of this gentleman. Uh, he was brought over from Germany at about age five, and they came into the Arizona Territory at, at about the age 12. Uh, it was said that if you took uh, some of these prominent uh, Indian fighters of the past and put the three worst ones together, they wouldn't have been as many Indian fights as Al Sieber was. He, had a, he was wounded many times. He also, um, before he became a scout for General Crook, uh, was in the Civil War. He was in some of the bloodiest battles that took place. Uh, it mentioned Al, uh, Antietam, Fredericksburg, and Gettysburg. Fredericksburg was a, was a terrible disaster for the Union. Uh, there wasn't a blade of grass to hide, hide behind, and they sent wave after wave of these soldiers up against Confederates who were behind a stone wall, and it was just a slaughter. Uh, and the angel of Fredericksburg had a monument there because this Confederate soldier had such sympathy for the wounded who were crying out during the night that he asked three times to take water to him and was rejected. But the third time, the, uh, the commanding officer just said, it's your life, go ahead. And although they did start shooting at him, when they realized what he was doing, they ceased fire. And he went and gave water to hundreds of these uh, wounded soldiers in the field. But at Gettysburg, uh, Al Sieber was a member of the 1st Minnesota. The 1st Minnesota was held in reserve when Pickett's charge took place. Uh, Pickett's group made it to the stone wall uh, and, and, and actually was crossing the stone wall when a general rode up to whoever was in charge and said, what have we got in reserve to stop these guys? And he pointed to the 1st Minnesota and said, that's all we got. And the general sent them in, and they stopped the, the charge. Uh, out of 234 men in the first Minnesota, only 47 of them came out unscathed. Al Siebert wasn't one of them. He got a ball in his ankle that went all the way up and come out his knee. It was the wonder he survived that in the, in the medical condition of the, of the Civil War. Later on, he, he was... Um, transporting the Apache kid and some other prisoners to Yuma and was again shot in that same ankle and it pretty much crippled him for life. Also, Al Sieber was the mentor of Tom Horn. And Tom Horn was present and interpreter at the surrender of Geronimo. When General Miles took place of, uh, of uh, G General Crook, he disbanded the use of Apache Indians. And Al Sieber was out of a job. Well, Al Sieber in 1903, Apache um, Trail was being built from between 1903 and 1905. Al Sieber was in charge of the 200 Apache Indians that was building the Apache Trail. And he was getting his, uh, his workers from uh, San Carlos. And of all people, the Indian agent at San Carlos was Yellowstone Kelly. Now think of all these famous people in Arizona that, that you don't hear about that much, but these people were the roughest, toughest pioneers you ever laid your eyes on. And Al Sieber, after the Apache Trail was built, they were widening a strip of it up at the dam and a huge boulder fell and crushed him to death. But uh, this is documentation that exists that you can find and it just depends on who's telling the story. You can see that they are all using the same source, but one thing was more important to one author than the other. Uh, but it, it documents that this, actual, this search actually took place. Thank you for watching this episode of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains. <laughs>